Um, my talk is a little more clinical than, uh, than the previous uh, presentation. Um, we're going to talk about sudden death and uh, start with uh, the definition, uh, incidence, risk of sudden cardiac death and risk factors for the, to develop sudden death, etiology, and prevention. And with that, the uh, current ACC um, definition of sudden cardiac death is uh, death following a sudden cardiac arrest, which is cessation of effective cardiac mechanical activity, and that can be by means of uh, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, it can be a PEA arrest, uh, but essentially resulting in unresponsiveness uh, and without normal breathing or uh, any signs of circulation. And the, the key feature of sudden cardiac death is that it's unexpected. And recently, the European Society of Cardiology came up with uh, a publication regarding, um, you know, the, the, this topic, and their, their definition of sudden cardiac death is um, one of the following, a potentially, the term is used when a potentially fatal cardiac condition was known to be present during life. So if someone dies, you kind of attribute that to that cardiac condition. Or if an autopsy identified a cardiac or vascular anomaly as the probable cause of the event. And, uh, Lastly, if there's no obvious extra cardiac causes, so they did an autopsy, they didn't find uh, any other cause for why someone passed away, and uh, therefore they attributed it to an arrhythmic event. Uh, so they didn't find a pulmonary embolus, there was no stroke, there was no evidence of anything else that, that malfunctioned and the patient just suddenly died. Um, and also I'd like you to separate in your mind, cardiac arrest should be used um, to signify an event uh, that, 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 rever that was reversed. Either spontaneously someone you know, had a cardiac arrest, but they spontaneously came out of it and recovered, or there was cardiopulmonary resuscitation, defibrillation, cardioversion, or cardiac pacing that got them out of the deadly rhythm they were in. Um, the leading cause, uh, causes of death, this is uh, just the most updated um, slide on the uh, CDC website, okay, and this is from 2014. So heart, heart disease to this day remains the leading cause of death in the United States with about 614,000 deaths per year. Uh, cancer is basically creeping up. If you look at the curves, they're kind of merging, and I think in the future there's a chance that cancer may sur surpass uh, um, cardiac conditions as the leading cause of death. But as of the last few years, and as of right now, it's still heart disease that kills most uh, people than anything else in the U.S. Um, in terms of the incidence of sudden cardiac death, it's, it's very hard to estimate this, uh, and the, uh, these are kind of like different numbers that have, uh, um, it's from different studies that were extrapolated from, you know, data in smaller populations, but then extrapolated to the United States to predict, you know, what the incidence of sudden death uh, is. And that number ranges from somewhere between um, 185,000 to about 450,000 deaths uh, caused by sudden cardiac death per year in the United States. So if you say, okay, so if we average that it's about, let's say, 300,000 deaths per year, that's basically half of all heart-related deaths in the United States. Okay, if we go back here, it was 614,000, and the estimate is about 300,000 for sudden cardiac death. So about half of them are caused by sudden cardiac death. We probably don't ever see these patients. These patients end up passing away at home or Perhaps they don't even make it to the hospital, or if they make it to the hospital, they might already be, you know, dead. So, in terms of the risk of sudden cardiac death, so in uh, in adolescence, from the time we're born until we're like um, in early adulthood, the the risk of sudden cardiac death is pretty low, it's 0 0.001 percent per year, a pretty low number, and it actually, if you look at this curve here, it declines as we kind of progress into adulthood. And that's because 
Uh, the causes of sudden cardiac death at this age group are kind of like the following here, long QT, short QT, hypertrophic, mainly genetic uh, conditions that, that uh, RV, ARVC, anomalous coronaries, Brugada syndrome, uh, all of these. Um, and if you have a severe form of that, one of these genetic uh, conditions, you know, you're more likely to die very young. And so I think that's one of the reasons why this curve declines for the first 20 years or so. Uh, if you kind of live through the first three years, few years of your life, you probably will live into adulthood. Um, and then we get to the general population, that's ages 35 or older, where the, uh, the, the risk of sudden cardiac death is between you know, one per 500 to one in a thousand, or about 0.1% per year. Um, um, usual causes for the general population are coronary atherosclerosis, dilated cardiomyopathy, valvular heart disease, or infiltrative uh, heart diseases. And if you look at patients who have advanced heart disease, they're at much higher risk for sudden death. And their risk is about 1 in 4 to 1 in 10, or 10 to 25 percent per year. Um, in terms of risk factors for uh, uh, sudden cardiac arrest, um, Clearly, reduced left ventricular ejection fraction, um, history of coronary disease or a prior myocardial infarction, um, dilated cardiomyopathy and heart failure. And dilated cardiomyopathy, is, as you know, a generic term can be ischemic due to coronary disease or non-ischemic in the absence of any coronary disease. For secondary prevention, obviously, if you've ever been resuscitated uh, from a prior VT, VF, or sudden cardiac arrest, that obviously puts you at higher risk for a recurrent episode. Uh, if you have inducible ventricular tachycardia in an EP study. And obviously, there are genetic disorders, just as I mentioned earlier, HOCOM, um, long QT, ARVC, and Brugada syndrome, as well as family history of sudden cardiac death that put, put us at risk for um, a, an event. Um, this is from a textbook by Dr. Zipes, the latest version. Um, but if you look at different studies, this number, the etiology of CAD, uh, I'm sorry, the etiology, the CAD uh, uh, causes about 75% of sudden cardiac death. That number is, depending on which study you look at, it varies anywhere from like 48% to something like 80%, but um, about 75%. And then dilated cardiomyopathy leads to about 10 to 15 percent of sudden cardiac death. Inflammatory and infiltrative conditions such as sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, valvular heart disease, and viral myocarditis. We don't have a true estimate for my, uh, viral myocarditis, and they believe some of the younger patients who die suddenly and unexpectedly uh, may have had some kind of uh, viral myocarditis, and that's just being missed. Um, but altogether, this contributes to about 10% of, of sudden cardiac death. And then the rare genetic disorders, the long QT and Brugada, if you put them all together, they're pretty, you know, they're like less than 1% uh, of, um, you know, sudden cardiac death. Uh, this was a study from Brazil back in the late 1980s, but they looked at about 157 patients who, unfortunately, this is the worst dream of any cardiologist, but uh, these are patients who were given a Holter monitor to evaluate probably for some, you know, palpitations or some uh, episodes that they were experiencing, and they died while wearing the Holter. So the, the, they, they gathered um, about 157 patients who, who unfortunately, uh, you know, died while wearing a, a Holter, and they found that 62% of the time it was uh, monomorphic VT that deteriorated to 2VF, and then led to their death. 8% uh, of the time was primary ventricular fibrillation. Uh, this was an era, 1989, where antiarrhythmic drugs were used. Um, so torsade de Poin uh, was seen about 13% of uh, the time. And then the other 17% of uh, the time was bradycardic episodes. Probably, the, they didn't specify, but probably their complete heart block or just sinus arrest that led to demise. This is an interesting slide. So we mainly focus on work in this territory here. Uh, so patients with previous myocardial infarction, low ejection fraction, and ventricular tachycardia. 
very high risk for sudden death, close over 30%. These are the patients that were studied in MATIC 1 and MUST studies, okay? Uh, patients with previous out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, these are our secondary prevention um, patients, and these were studied in AVID, CAS, and SIDS. Uh, and then patients with ejection fraction less than 35% and congestive heart failure, uh, these are SCUDHEF and MATIC patients. But kind of look at this for a second. This Patients. These are all patients who we see routinely in the hospital and in our clinics, and they end up receiving a defibrillator. But they constitute a minority of patients, really, because most of, uh, in terms of numbers, most sudden cardiac deaths occur in, in the general population in patients that you wouldn't even expect uh, to, uh, you know, that they would have sudden death, uh, or patients who have just a high coronary risk profile, so the diabetic who smokes, who doesn't take care of themselves but never see a doctor. You know, those are the patients who actually die suddenly uh, and actually in larger numbers. Um, and patients who had a prior coronary event, someone who had a stent placed, they did well for a few years, EF is normal, you know, it doesn't give you a clue that that patient will die suddenly and uh, unfortunately what I'm, the point of this slide is that we're missing a lot of patients. And it's very hard to cherry pick out of the general population who's going to have a, a sudden episode and who won't. We know that, based on multiple studies, that reduced left ventricular ejection fraction remains the single most important risk factor for overall mortality and, and sudden cardiac death. But it's not the only one, obviously. Um, in this study uh, from 1997, uh, they basically, you can see that, you know, patients with 30% or uh, less of ejection fraction had a 7.5. This was a, a, a Dutch study, uh, I want to say Dr. Wellens group, um, and they looked at um, nearly 9,000 patients that they followed for about between 1991 to 1994 is when they registered these patients and they published the study in 97. So they followed them for about five or six years. But in that period, they found a 7.5% risk of death for patients with an EF less than 30%. And as you can tell, patients with EFs that are near normal or you know, not so bad um, have a lower incidence of sudden cardiac arrest. However, um, still 56% of all sudden cardiac arrest in these victims happened in patients who had an EF greater than 30%. So, you know, we have an arbitrary number, you know, 35% EF. So does that mean that if you're at 34, you get a defibrillator, and if you're at 36, you don't have any risk? It doesn't quite work that way. Um, this slide shows you the severity of heart failure and modes of death. So I'm going to just go over this. I don't know the the the, the, uh, the audience is a, a cardiology audience, but New York Heart Association is the way we classify heart failure. And um, New York Heart Association class one is someone who's essentially asymptomatic. New York Heart Association class four is someone who has symptoms, you know, sitting in a chair. Uh, and then most of our patients, the ones that we see in the hospital or, you know, uh, in our clinics, are somewhere between class two and class three. Um, so this is a patient who only gets symptoms with moderate exertion, so they can do most things in, in their daily uh, life, but when they try to push themselves, they get symptomatic. And then class three is the patient who has symptoms with just bare minimal activity. So. The point of this slide is that even the patients who you might think are, they're okay, you know, therefore they can do pretty much most things in, in their daily life, but once in a while they get a little sort of breath, um, or, you know, their edema isn't perfect, they're not completely dry, but they're, you know, predominantly on the dry side. Those patients are actually, you shouldn't underestimate them because they have, uh, they die of sudden cardiac death in 64% of the time, okay? and 
as we get into the more advanced stages of uh, congestive heart failure, that number drops, right? And by class four, uh, most deaths occur probably because of pump failure or other comorbidities associated with heart failure. Maybe their kidneys give out, maybe, you know, just circulatory and pump failure uh, issues, and less so uh, sudden cardiac death. So, is the ECG a reliable predictor of uh, sudden cardiac death? And should we be doing mass screening of the population? Can we identify those patients that I showed you that, that form the majority of uh, patients having sudden, uh, sudden death? Well, the answer is that it's unclear. We're not sure if it's cost effective. Uh, it may or may not change the incidence rate of sudden cardiac death. And the bottom line is that there are a lot of false positives and a lot of false negatives. Um, and the European Society of Cardiology very recently stated that overall, we cannot provide recommendations for population screening at this time, okay? And specifically, there was the Copenhagen City Heart Study where they looked at nearly 19,000 patients. Off of those 19,000 patients, uh, they looked at patients who died before the age of 50, and they found 207 patients, and of those 207 patients, 143 had some chronic condition. That chronic condition was cancer, or they were alcohol or drug abusers, or they had known cardiovascular comorbidities, or they had trauma, suicide, homicide. They had another reason of why they passed away. And then they focused on the ones that had either, they had either no known chronic conditions, or they were, they were never hospitalized. And they came up with about 64 patients, and of those 64 patients, 24, they determined that 24 of those had sudden death. So they looked at those 24 patients in comparison to just a control group to see if there are any differences in their EKGs. Is there something that you can pick up on the EKG that can give you a clue that, you know, that's a risk factor? Their P waves were essentially identical in width. The PR interval was identical, essentially. QRS duration was the same. Corrected QT was the same. The S in V1 and the R in V5 and V6 was the same, and fragmentation was similar, early repolarization was similar. So the ECG did not have predictive value for sudden cardiac death, okay? Um, and what about pre-participation in sports? This is a big deal. This is, you know, our young athletes or people that should live a full normal life that collapse in the field. And, and they go back and forth in the national meetings about, about this topic, whether we should screen them or not. And in Italy and Japan, everyone who's gonna play soccer basically, uh, either professionally or semi-professionally, has to have some kind of screening. In the United States, there was a task force a few years ago that kind of said, again, looked into, is it, is it cost effective? Are we gonna pick up more false positives, false negatives, or should we be doing this? Uh, so the most recent iteration from the European guidelines say, you know, they support pre-participation pre screening and they recommend doing a clinical evaluation, assessing the personal and family history and getting a baseline 12 lead ECG. Um, if someone presents to you and says, you know, my brother or sister had sudden cardiac unexplained death, you know, probably you should get a, a personal history on that patient if they've ever had an event a family history, mainly focused on, on cardiac diseases and sudden death. And then typically the workup includes a 12 lead ECG, a 24 hour ambulatory ECG, and perhaps an exercise stress test. We do provocative testing in the lab, uh, in the EP lab. In, we don't have asmaline in the United States, but we do use flecainide to assess for Brugada syndrome. That flecainide brings out Brugada syndrome. You can also do a hyperchordia lead ECG where you basically move V1, V2 up a couple of intercoastal spaces and that can bring out the uh, Brugada pattern. In our practice lately, we've been using a lot of cardiac MRI. And the reason why we do that is because um, if in the absence of epicardial coronary disease and if you don't see anything profound on the, uh, on the echocardiogram, the cardiac MRI is a good tool to assess for, the, uh, for any infiltrative process in the myocardium. Is there a scar? Is there anything that clues you in as to whether or not this patient has a predisposition 
um, to develop sudden cardiac death. And clearly genetic testing. So if you see something on the ECG or you get a clue from their history that they may have uh, a genetic condition, uh, you should send for molecular genetic testing, but perhaps uh, refer them to a genetic counselor. Um, regarding uh, AEDs, it is recommended that uh, public access defibrillation be established uh, wherever you think that you know there might be a lot of people that can potentially have sudden death. That includes schools, airports, sport venues, um, casinos, etc. As well as areas where um, defibrillation is not available. So if you're on a train or an airplane and you know they won't have a, a cart there, the ambulance can't get to you. Uh, so they're recommending a, uh, with a class one level of evidence B uh, for placement of AEDs. And, and these are popping up everywhere, which is kind of a good thing. Uh, these are, you, you're all aware of these, uh, but these are all the studies regarding defibrillators. And um, so, you know, you know of MADID-1, non-sustained VT and a positive EP study with, in patients with an EF of less than 35%. The hazard ratio of patients who had a defibrillator compared to patients who didn't get a defibrillator was 46%, so a significant reduction in mortality. And in terms of um, the primary uh, prevention studies, MADID and Scott Heft, they, both of those showed a reduction in mortality with a defibrillator. The reason why we don't give defibrillators to someone at the time of Cabot's is because of the Cabot's PATS trial in 97 that basically showed no difference. Um, if, you, if you have a low EF and you get a defibrillator versus not get a defibrillator and you just get revascularization, there was no significant difference there. And, and the Dynamit trial from 2004 is one of the reasons why we don't implant defibrillators um, early on after an MI. Uh, so, you know, you wait at least 40 days after an MI and you wait, you know, closer to you know, three months or longer uh, after revascularization. And think about it, I mean, would you take someone with a myocardial infarction and uh, who just had an MI and operate on them for any reason? Would you, I mean, we don't, I mean, if the surgeon comes and says, well, you, know, you know, they have, you know, appendicitis and we need to take out the appendix, you're like, well, the risk is high. So it's the same thing. If you try to implant someone, I mean, uh, implanting a defibrillator is not that heavy of an operation, however, uh, you know, you subject that patient to anesthesia, and in any terms, you usually don't recommend surgery for someone at the time of a recent MI. You let them cool off, and you bring them back later on. And, and the AVID, CAS, and SIDS trials um, were secondary prevention trials, and, and they also showed um, a significant benefit and reduction in the risk. So um, you got to look at your patient, and if your patient has had a history of a cardiac arrest, VF, or VT, you should consult NEP for a defibrillator. This is secondary prevention. For your patients without really significant uh, heart failure symptoms, but patients who've had a prior MI and despite uh, optimal medical therapy, their EF uh, remains low, these patients are still considered candidates, and it's appropriate to implant an ICD. Most of the patients we work with are in this category here, New York Heart Association class 2 to 3 heart failure symptoms. And uh, first of all, you have to make sure your patient is in guideline-directed medical therapy. Uh, beta blockers and ACE inhibitors appropriately dosed, um, perhaps an aldosterone receptor blocker, and you know, additional medications as, as they're coming out uh, with new research. So you have to optimize their therapy first, whatever they can tolerate. Um, if you've achieved this, then you have to make an uh, assessment of their EF. And if their EF is low, less than 35%, and if they're ischemic, and it's been more than 40 days after their MI, more than three months after you've achieved this, you should consult an EP for an ICD. If they're non-ischemic, you wait at least three months, closer to six to nine months, and then you should refer your patient for the defibrillator. If they're class three or class four and their QRS is greater than 120, you should really consider cardiac resynchronization therapy, a biventricular defibrillator. Um, 
if their EF is greater than 35% and they still have symptoms, they're not quite a candidate for a defibrillator, but you should consider uh, referring them to a heart failure specialist. The reason why this slide is very similar, but I want to show you some of the exclusion criteria. So New York Heart Association class four, but unless they're eligible for CRT. So your New York Heart Association class patient, uh, class four patient who has a very wide QRS, mainly left bundle branch block, but even a very wide right bundle branch block, you should consider those patients for CRT. But if their QRS is very narrow, then they'll have very little benefit. As I showed you in previous slides, these patients tend to pass away for other reasons, other than just, you know, arrhythmic. If your patient has cardiogenic shock or they're hypotensive, if they just had cabbage or PCI, if they're a candidate for coronary revascularization, you should do that first. You should revascularize your patient first. Uh, obviously, if they've had brain damage or, or if something else is going to take their life in less than a year, if they have some malignant form of cancer that's in an advanced stage, there's no benefit of the ICD. And the last thing I'd like to talk about is uh, the wearable defibrillators. Um, so in our practice, we don't use this very much. And it's not that we have anything against life vests. It's just that the, the, the data is quite limited. And I think it's, it's useful for certain situations. So I think uh, someone who's at very high risk, let's say someone has peripartum cardiomyopathy, they drop their EF, they're at high risk, but they're pregnant and you may not want to expose them to radiation perhaps, um, that might be a good candidate. Or someone who has active myocarditis and you anticipate full recovery but they're having a lot of ectopy and you're concerned, might be a candidate. Or someone who had an MI and you know, 48 hours after the uh, revascularization, they're still, you're still noticing a lot of ectopy on, on telemetry, non-sustained VT. They're not quite fitting criteria for an ICD, but you're, they're a little higher risk patient. Perhaps they live alone, they have no one else around. There's very specific scenarios when, when we use it. Uh, we use it a, 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 a wearable uh, life vest. Now, for the average person who comes into the hospital, they get a new diagnosis of congestive heart failure with a low EF. Um, unless they have a lot of ectopy, I usually don't recommend a life vest. They, they can, they, and, and there's the, the WEAR IT trial that came out recently showed that a little more benefit with ischemic cardioma, cardiomyopathy patients compared to the non-ischemic cardiomyopathy patients. The, the non-ischemic cardiomyopathy patient, patients essentially had almost no benefit from, from the from the wearable defibrillator. So with that, if you have any questions, I'll be